Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics, and I want to welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, before I introduce uh, the speaker, Mrs. Gingrich, I want to go over some ground rules for tonight's event. Uh, freedom of speech and civility are bedrock principles here at the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at Harvard University and our democracy. And in fact, in his inaugural address, President Kennedy reminded us that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. The Forum is one of the few places in America where you can hear from national and world leaders, hear them speak, and then have their speeches followed by unfettered question and answer session with members of the audience, a practice that invariably results in lively exchanges. The reason why this is successful is our audience respects our speakers' rights to free speech, as well as the right of our audience members to listen to our speakers. In turn, our speakers respect our audience's right to ask unfiltered, sometimes tough, sorry about that, but always fair questions. Now, by following tonight's rules, this is going to be yet another successful event here at the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. So tonight, we're pleased to welcome to the forum, Speaker and Mrs. Newt Gingrich. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I think this is your fourth time here in the forum. I was actually here in 1993 for your first address when I was an undergraduate, and we're glad to have you back. Uh, Mrs. Gingrich, it's your first time here, and we're glad to have you. Speaker Gingrich represented Georgia in Congress for 20 years and served as Speaker of the United States House of Representatives for four years. He's the architect of the contract with America that led the Republican Party to victory in 1994 by capturing the majority in the U.S. House for the first time in 40 years. Speaker Gingrich received his bachelor's degree from Emory University and a master's and doctorate in modern European history from Tulane University. And before his election to Congress, he taught history and environmental studies at West Georgia College for eight years. Callista Gingrich is the president of Gingrich Productions, a multimedia production company based in Washington, D.C. And prior to leading Gingrich Productions, she served 18 years on staffs in Congress in the United States House of Representatives. She graduated cum laude and earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in music with a concentration in public communication from Luther College in Decorah, Iowa, Speaker and Mrs. Gingrich host and produce award-winning documentary films, including A City Upon a Hill, which we will view today. Please join me in welcoming Speaker and Mrs. Newt Gingrich. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for coming to our screening of A City Upon a Hill. Newt and I would like to thank the Institute of Politics for the opportunity to be with you here this evening. We'd also like to thank our producer, David Bossy, our director, Kevin Knobloch, and the entire team at Citizens United Productions with whom we made this film. A City Upon a Hill explores the concept of American exceptionalism from its origin to present day. Puritan John Winthrop first captured the idea of an exceptional nation in 1630 when he encouraged settlers headed to the New World to create a community, or as he called it, a city upon a hill, to serve as a model for the rest of the world. Our founding fathers had this same idea in mind when they created America's founding documents, defined by the ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At no other time in history had a nation declared that its citizens were endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, rights that no king or government could take away. This truth, that our rights come from God, has provided Americans with boundless freedom and opportunity. Yet today, many misunderstand why America is an exceptional nation often claiming that we're no different from other countries. But American exceptionalism is not a matter of arrogance. It's a recognition that we are a unique nation based on individual liberty, dignity, and personal responsibility. If we forget this, we will be in danger of surrendering our rights as individuals, 
the antithesis of what our founding fathers envisioned for America. As citizens, we must have the courage to ensure that America remains an exceptional nation, a challenge that is the essence of the American creed. We hope you will enjoy A City Upon a Hill and share its message. Thank you and God bless. Let, let me uh, join Cliss in thanking all of you, first of all, for being here and for allowing us to share this with you. I hope as you watch the film, you'll think about questions. Say. <clears throat> Disrupting the forum, Harvard Security, please remove those individuals. So, as I was saying, I hope, I hope that you will. Harvard Police, please make your way up to there on the third floor. Sorry, Mr. Speaker, for the interruption. Yeah. At, actually, and I'll be glad to take questions later on about those kind of ideas. I think we are 100%. I think we are all Americans, and I think it's important. As I started to say, I hope, I hope as you watch the film, Calista has written a, a children's introductory book for 48-year-olds called Sweet Land of Liberty, which actually became a New York Times bestseller. And I wrote a book aimed at you and other folks, other citizens, called A Nation Like No Other. There's a Pew result out today that exactly illustrates why we're having this conversation. Because in order to test how many Americans liked American exceptionalism, the Pew Foundation asked the question, how many of you think our culture is superior? Which is not at all what it means. American exceptionalism relates directly to one document, the Declaration of Independence, to its assertion that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that we are all created equal, that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. From that assertion comes citizenship rather than being a subject. It's a reason that Abraham Lincoln, in 1861, on his way to being inaugurated, stopped at Independence Hall and said in Philadelphia, at the eve of the Civil War, nothing that mattered in his political philosophy in his entire life came from anywhere except the Declaration of Independence. And I believe next year, this will be one of the central questions in the presidential campaign, whether we are, in fact, an exceptional nation endowed by our creator, or whether, like the European countries, we are simply subjects to a government, randomly gathered protoplasm with no inherent liberties, simply existing at the sufferance of the elites. And I think the difference in those two is extraordinary. I hope you enjoyed the film. I look forward to your questions afterwards. I've never been here before that it didn't turn out to be fun and interesting and different. I am confident you will make it the same tonight. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and invitations to the major presidential candidates. And, and a lot of them come to speak here in the forum. I'm really glad to have you here. When I emailed you, uh, you said, hey, I've got an idea. Let's do a screening of a documentary. Let's talk about American exceptionalism. Uh, and then we'll talk and we'll do some Q&A. Uh, that's not the normal way <laughs> that the candidates respond to our invitation. We said, sure, let's do it. And you actually told me, you know, go, find, go on the website, pick out one. And I, I hope you all like this one. I picked this one out. Um, why? Uh, why do you want to do it this way? Why do you want to show the documentary and then talk about it? I think that the largest choice facing the United States is actually a cultural choice. And I began getting involved in this back in uh, 
2002, when the Ninth Circuit Court ruled that one nation under God in the statute and in, 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 in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance was unconstitutional. Uh, interestingly, tomorrow is the anniversary of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And in 1863, Lincoln sits on the dais looking out over the first national military cemetery, the graves of thousands of young men, and he adds to his address under God. Those of you who think that was just a random notation, go to the Lincoln Memorial, where on one side you will see one nation under God. On the other side, you'll see his second inaugural, March of 1865, four years of war, 620,000 dead Americans. <coughs> Lincoln took the war as a personal responsibility. He knew that at any point where he would accept the South leaving, the war would end. So in a sense, he willed the preservation of the Union at the cost of 620,000 dead. It fundamentally reshaped him as a person. You can see this if you read his magnificent, rational, lawyer-like speech at, at Cooper Union, 7,200 words in February of 1860, and then read 1865. In 702 words, Abraham Lincoln refers to God 14 times and quotes the Bible twice. Now, I responded to the Ninth Circuit much like Lincoln responded to the Dred Scott decision in the 1850s, which said that slavery was automatically extended across the whole country. Because I honestly believe that we are either an exceptional nation endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, in which case each one of you is personally sovereign and you loan power to the state. The state does not loan power to you. I believe that was the heart of America. I think the Founding Fathers wrote it very deliberately. It represented the essence of their understanding of life. That's why they start out by saying we hold these truths to be self-evident. And I believe we're in a great cultural struggle, of which this campus is one of the centerpieces, between people who believe that that's all nonsense, that we're essentially randomly gathered protoplasm who happen to have lucked out and then ended up geographically in a place that has reasonably good government that has not yet been totally destroyed by power-hungry politicians, but that there's no inherent underlying structure of exceptionalism. And this notion of exceptionalism is at the very core of being American. It's why the Wright brothers, you know, the Wright brothers and the Smithsonian are engaged in a competition. The Smithsonian got $50,000 from Congress and failed. The Wright brothers got nothing and invented the airplane. It's a class, and it's not the Congress, <laughs> I'm not saying the, 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 that it's good, good government, bad government, I'm saying the spirit of, on, of, of entrepreneurial pioneering, the spirit of creating things, the spirit that any one of us in this room can be virtually anything, is a peculiarly American experience. Arnold Schwarzenegger gets to be governor of our, of our largest state, worth hundreds of millions of dollars. If he had stayed in Austria, it would have been hopeless. Nobody of his background could have become president of Austria. It would have been an absurdity. Yet here he can. And so we engage in a cultural struggle. Clifton and I have now done seven movies, all of them documentaries as part of the cultural struggle. I've written a series of books. She just wrote Sweet Land of Liberty for 48-year-olds. But this is the cultural component of the political campaign. I'll give you one example. I have a pro proposal that if you get unemployment compensation, you should be required to sign up for a training program. That we should not give people money for 99 weeks for doing nothing. That it fundamentally undermines them, limits them, weakens them. And if you can't find a job, we ought to take the time we are paying you and make sure you learn so you can actually get a job because that way you dramatically expand human capital, but you also reestablish the work ethic. I also say to all of you who are students, and you're all elite students at an elite university, so this will not shock you. But one of my messages is I, this is a sign of how daring I am as a candidate. As I go around the country, I say, look, one of the keys is really simple. Students are gonna actually have to study. <laughs> you know, we actually have to have grades given based on achievement. We can't afford to socially promote because it cheats the kids. Now, that's the scale of difference uh, that I think we represent. And in th this film, in that sense, I've, I've always thought there'd be three great themes next year 
if I end up uh, in, in seven three-hour debates with President Obama. One would be the economy, because, I mean, how can you have this level of right. disaster and not have that focus? The second would be the question of American exceptionalism versus the sort of bureaucratic socialist model. Uh, and the third would be national security. And that those three will be the organizing principles of the entire campaign. And that's why this film, I thought, was a very useful starting point. Great. Well, let's, let's go to those other two topics or those debates. Uh, start with the economy. What would you do if you were president to get this economy moving again? One of the reasons I became a historian is that imitation is cheaper than invention. So mm. you want to solve something, <laughs> go look for somebody who solved it. I've been through two sets of solutions on the economy, 1979, 1980. Art Laffer, who's up there, who invented the Laffer Curves, uh, Jude Winiski, Jack Kemp, uh, a bunch of us helped create supply-side economics. Ronald Reagan campaigned on it. I campaigned with him. I was a freshman congressman. Reagan had four pillars to his economic policy. Cut taxes, cut regulations, develop American energy, and reward, honor, and, and talk well of people who create jobs. The opposite of Obamaism, which is higher taxes, more regulation, anti-American energy, and class warfare. What was the result? I mean, just, just objective facts. This goes back to the phrase empiricist uh, that was used at one point in the movie. In September of 1983, we created a million 100,000 jobs in one month. Under Reagan, the job creation momentum was such that given our current population base, it would be 25 million new jobs. So we slid back a little bit. Uh, there was a tax increase. I fought. We were in a recession. I get elected speaker. And what do I do? Cut taxes, cut regulations, focus on American energy, support people who create jobs. What's the result? In the four years I'm speaker, we create 11 million new jobs. Unemployment drops to 4.2%. Now, what's the fiscal consequence for everybody who's watching this idiotic super committee? <laughs> the fiscal consequence is simple. When I went into office, the Congressional Budget Office said in the next 10 years, the deficit would be $2.7 trillion. When I left office after four years, the Congressional Budget Office said the surplus would be $2.3 trillion. That's a $5 trillion swing. Ironically, nobody that I know of at the Budget Committee, on the Super Committee, has reached out to anybody who's actually balanced the budget. And I'm the only speaker in your lifetime to balance the budget for four years. How, why did it happen like that? Well, if you, if you create jobs, you take people off of Medicaid, off of public housing, off of food stamps, off of unemployment, off of welfare, so you're reducing government spending without pain. I mean, no, you're not going out here and chopping people off. They're leaving to go to work. When they go to work, they are paying taxes. So you actually have a reduction in cost, a rise in, I'm for higher revenue, I'm just against taxes. Uh, you have a rise in revenue, and the consequence of those is the largest single step you ever take to a balanced budget. So. The third pillar, or the third comp topic of conversation you wanted to have with, with uh, President Obama if you were the nominee, is involving national security. How would you keep our country safe? What do you see as our role in the world? Well, I think, first of all, and this might be moderately controversial, um, we are in the world. There's no conceivable isolationism that will work. And that's very mm -hmm. important, because once you start out by saying we're in the world, then you say, OK, so if we, if we are an exceptional, unique civilization, how do we defend our interest in the world? How do we express our values in the world? And that becomes a very large and very complex question. I'll just take two examples. Let's take China and uh, radical Islamism, both of which require fundamental thought. The president just engaged in, in symbolic behavior in Australia. We're going to send 2,500 Marines to Australia. Now, that's irritating the Chinese, but I doubt if it's impressing them. <laughs> they, I mean, they have the largest army in the world. And the idea of you know, 2,500 Marines. I'm an army brat. I express a certain bias. Those of you who are Marines, Semper Fi. I'm just telling you, <laughs> 2,500 Marines ain't enough. And, and yeah, it's, it's actually a useful thing to do. I'm not against doing it. But it's not central to our relation with China. If you, if you really want to worry about China, Ironically, you have to worry about the United States. What are the key factors? 
rebuild our industrial base, rebuild our science and technology base, rebuild our education system. If we get America straight, the Chinese won't catch up with us in 100 years. If we don't get America straight, the Chinese are going to pass us because we're stupid. Now, it is not possible for us to make an argument with the Chinese that they owe it to us to be as dumb as we are. And so if we really want to compete with China, we have got to focus. And, and this came straight out of the hart rudman Commission, which I helped create with President Clinton. And when I stepped down, he asked me to serve on it. Uh, and we spent three years studying American national security, reported in March of 2001. We said the greatest threat to the United States is a weapon of mass destruction going off in an American city, probably by a terrorist group. We said the second greatest threat to the United States is the failure of math and science education and the failure to invest in science and technology. And we then said what I thought was a startling thing for a national security uh, report. We said it is a greater threat than any conceivable conventional war. So I would argue that fixing the schools, fixing the industrial base, rebuilding our investment in science and technology are national security issues. And if we do them right, the Chinese are sort of irrelevant. If we do them, don't do them right, frankly, we're in enormous trouble. The Middle East is totally different. I, I was very sobered a couple months ago. General John Abizade, who I believe is the only four-star general who's fluent in Arabic, was the head of the Central Command, now retired. But he, he's been saying, our strategic deficit is greater than our fiscal deficit. And I think that's a very sobering way to think about it. We, we, we are in a challenge in the Middle East so much larger and more complex than anything our current foreign policy establishment can deal with, that it is very, very sobering. And I think we need to talk about it. And in that sense, I don't think, I, I don't know that I'm a hawk so much as I'm an owl. I think we need wisdom mm -hmm in trying to deal with this, because it is a very, very serious problem. Before we open up to the audience, let me ask you a couple personal questions. Uh, our mission at the IOP is to inspire students to pursue careers in politics and public service. How did you, why did you decide to run for office the first time? I was originally going to be either a zoo director uh, or a, <laughs> and I know it's some of your thinking. It came uh, in handy when you were speaker. Well, actually, there's a great book, there's a great book by a, uh, 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 called uh, Chimpanzee Politics, uh, which I recommend to all of you, which is a study of the uh, social structure of the Arnhem Zoo's chimpanzee colony, and it, uh, it's a really great introduction <laughs> to politics among large primates. Um, <laughs> and it, it's a terrific book. Uh, but anyhow, I was going to be either a zoo director or a vertebrate paleontologist. And uh, in the, uh, my dad was stationed in Orléans, France. He was in, in the infantry for 27 years. And we, late in my uh, freshman year in high school, we went to the battlefield of Verdun, which was the largest battlefield in World War I, about 600,000 French and German dead in a nine-month period, and uh, stayed with a friend of my father's who had uh, been drafted in 1941, sent to the Philippines, served in the Bataan Death March, and ended up spending three and a half years in a Japanese prison camp. So we were talking all weekend about the cost of defeat. And then, literally, the French paratroopers came in from Algeria, killed the French Fourth Republic, and brought de Gaulle back to create the Fifth Republic. And that, shortly after that, we moved to Stuttgart. I mean, so as a, as a young kid from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, I'm thinking, this is all real. I, I used to, we used to drive in our bus to the, uh, to the American school past World War II bomb damage. I mean, so, so all of this was extraordinarily real. And I spent the summer thinking and praying about it. And in August of 1958, just before my sophomore year in high school, uh, I decided that my mission, if you will, uh, or my vocation, uh, was to do three things. Understand what America has to do to survive. Understand how to explain it so the American people would let you do it. And understand how you would implement it if they gave permission. And so I, from that point on, have read books in the summer of 1960, I was a volunteer in the Nixon Lodge campaign, I went back to reading books, and I went back and forth that way for my whole career. Uh, and so I've been actively, this is my 53rd year of trying to understand what we have to do as a country. Yeah. Well, my, my last question, this is one a, a student asked me to ask you. We're in a part of Harvard named after President Kennedy, who was the first Catholic president of the United States and the only Catholic president to date. Uh, a couple years ago, you converted to Catholicism. What motivated that, and how has that uh, shift that in your, uh, in your faith or um, impacted your political beliefs? 
if at all? Well, I think what happened was, uh, my wife, Calista, who all of you met earlier, uh, is a cradle Catholic and uh, sings in the choir of the uh, Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, which is the largest Catholic church in the United States. And so just to be supportive, I used to go every Sunday and mm -hmm. Being a good husband, right. And uh, plus, given my musical skills, they thought my sitting in the audience was a terrific Good spot for you, yeah. Part. yeah. Um, <laughs> but I found myself over time, I think part of my soul is medieval. And, and so I found myself over time that the Basilica is an extraordinary institution and, and uh, I became more and more and more comfortable and frankly more and more intrigued with the Catholic approach to the Eucharist. Um, and I got involved in long conversations with Monsignor Rossi, who is the, uh, uh, the rector of the Basilica. And it just struck me that <clears throat> the combination of the intellectual background of 2,000 years of, of Catholic scholarship and the power of uh, the representation of Christ every Sunday or every time you go to Mass, seven days a week, if you go to Mass, seven days a week, is an extraordinary experience. And when um, Pope Benedict came, and I, 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 this all got much deeper because the choir went to Rome and I went along. It was one of the first times in my life I'd actually, I took a week off. I was the spouse. Uh, and when they, they were making a CD, they were recording a CD for uh, Pope John Paul II. And so I spent the afternoon and the evening relaxed. And then they'd come back about 11 o'clock at night because they had to do all the recording in the evening when the church was, that they were in Santa Maria Maggiore was closed to, to tourists. And so Monsignor Rossi and I would talk. And then when they came back about 11 o'clock at night, we'd go to some fabulous local Italian restaurant in Rome. And my job was essentially to, to provide the wine. Uh, and, and so I was very popular with the choir. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but the course of those conversations started the process of thinking and talking about uh, the, the, the role, the centrality of religion uh, and when Pope Benedict came, uh, I was allowed as a spouse to be at the Basilica when the bishops met with the Pope, and I, I happened to see him. And there was something about the sense of joy and, and the fact um, that he had chosen Christ our hope, which I happen to believe is true. And I, I believed all the way back to when my grandmother was raising me as a child. And my grandmother, when my mother was working, my grandmother sort of took over and was very intensely focused on convincing me that there's heaven and that there's hell, that there's an extreme difference in the two futures, and, and that she was prepared to communicate hell as vividly as needed <laughs> for me to decide that heaven was a better uh, choice. <clears throat> and it just, it, so I tell people, I didn't decide to become Catholic. I think I gradually became Catholic mm. and woke up to that realization. And the biggest thing it's done for me is a, is a sense of being at peace with myself. Uh, that is really, uh, the church is an extraordinary community within which to seek reconciliation with God. Okay. Well, we're going to, now we're going to invite the audience to uh, participate. We've got four microphones. Uh, there's two on the floor. There's two in the booths. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Uh, just a couple reminders of our standard rules here at the JFK Junior Forum. Uh, please uh, identify yourself and your Harvard affiliation. Uh, one brief question per questioner. No speeches. Uh, we had one well, it wasn't really a speech, but it's, it's his show. It's not your show. Uh, and the best questions are those with, that end with a question mark. And we'll start right here. Hi. Hi. My name's Denise Velasco, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. I'm a mid-career MPA candidate. Um, it was mentioned in the movie that uh, American exceptionalism, in part, is the idea that it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, and it doesn't matter who your parents are. It's a sharp turn from immigration legislation that you strongly supported in 1996 that would bar the children of undocumented immigrants from schools. How do you reconcile that contradictory idea that still persists in your party? Well, I, I think we have a long tradition of being the most open to immigration of any country in the world. I think we have an extraordinary challenge if you live in a world of seven billion people for whom probably uh, the number who would, who would come here tomorrow morning, if they could find a way to get here, would at least double our population. Uh, and so you have a, you have a permanent tension. I, I think the correct answer is to control the border and to find a way to have a guest worker program that is effective and to find some kind of process. I've suggested a World War II style selective service model, uh, which would allow you to, to, to sort out 
people who have only been here a short time and have no real ties who ought to go home, and people who have been here a long time and have real ties. And the Creeble Foundation has suggested a, what they call a red card program uh, as a way of, of uh, giving people a path to legality without having a path to citizenship. And I'd like to see us get to a point where everybody who remains in the U.S. is legal uh, and has access to all of the assets of the United States. But Even I think the it's children a complicated of undocumented transition. immigrants? Huh? Even the children of undocumented immigrants? If, if they are here and they go through this process and they end up with a red card, yes. If they, if, they do, if they don't end up with a red card and they don't end up with a guest worker permit, I would not allow them to stay here. I mean, I think that, which is why I think you've got to render judgment. I, I don't think we're going to take someone who's been here 23 years and who has three kids and two grandkids and belongs to a local church and has been totally law-abiding since they got here. I do not believe we're going to kick them out. And I think we ought to have an honest conversation about immigration reform, not just each side yelling at each other. Thank you. Next question, right here. Yes. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you very much for coming here and speaking to us and for this interesting movie. Um, my name is Bernard Metz. I'm an MPA student at the Kennedy School from Europe. And I have a question on <laughs> what do you think about Europe? Well, what, what, which part of Europe are you from? Um, Bavaria. So the movie and the definition of I exceptionalism. Like, I like beer. I'm sorry? <laughs> you're from, so you like beer. From, Everybody you're likes from beer. Bavaria, I like beer. Does that count as a But party? they don't like American beer that much. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, you can. <laughs> well, actually, I like Guinness more because I'm half Irish. So yeah. I, <laughs> I actually like Czech beer, but that's a different story. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, we're enjoying it, but the other uh, question. Pilsner, <laughs> Pilsner or Cal, or what do you, what, what's your Pilsner question? Pilsner or Urquell. Okay. Okay. So, um, you so were asking. the movie based the definition on, uh, of exceptionalism to a high degree on differentiation from, as was mentioned several times, corrupt, unfree Europe and other parts of the world, which was certainly true 250 years ago. And I totally agree um, that, that there were good reasons for coming to the free United States. But um, then afterwards now, you also mentioned that you think that Arnold Schwarzenegger couldn't have become president of Austria. So um, I'm wondering, do you base your perception of Europe on historical facts? Or do you still think that Europe is a dictatorship? And if so, well, how will? I didn't say it was a dictatorship. I said there's a, there, essentially there's a class system that is very hard to break through. Uh, it's still true even in Great Britain. I mean, there, there are extraordinary differences of class and, and, and uh, who gets to rise and who doesn't. The political party systems are dramatically more closed than they are here. I mean, look, look at our wild and wide open political presidential races, whether it's last time when the heir apparent got defeated by Obama, or it's this time when we can't figure out who the front runner is because they don't last long enough. <laughs> uh, this is the most open to talent system on the planet. Now, that's just an objective fact. And I, but I was describing cultural and caste and societal behaviors that had nothing to do with dictatorship. Uh, it has to do with the fact that Europe tends to be run by oligarchies who love cartels and who try to avoid the public by burying everything in bureaucracy. Just look at, I did my dissertation in Brussels. Just go look at the, at the common market bureaucracy in Brussels and the degree to which it represents a bureaucratic control of Europe uh, hidden away from the average person. Uh, there's dramatically less democracy in Europe than there is in the United States. There are 25,000 bureaucrats in Brussels running a system of 500 million people. Uh, average city in the United States has more bureaucrats. But okay, that's not a question, so I'm done. So. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Up here. Hi, Speaker. I'm Holly Flynn. I'm a freshman at the college. And two details from your film really stood out to me. One was Phyllis Schlafly's commentary, and the other was the characterization of women winning World War II as a negative image. So I'd like you to clarify your stance on women's rights, and I'd like to hear what you would do to ensure w gender equality in the United States, given that even today women make 77 cents to every man's dollar. Uh. The latter, the latter is going to change dramatically in the next generation because more women are going to college than men, and they are doing better than men, and they are entering professions more than men. And in fact, if anything, you'll be here in 15 years wondering what we do about male inequality and male unemployment 
because the people who have had the deepest decline in income, in fact, are males who don't go to college. Uh, but that'll be another story another day. On uh, <clears throat> Schlafly's case, the only thing I thought that Schlafly really talked about was that if you redistribute wealth, you took money from somebody. And you have to ask the moral question, by what right are you taking money? What, why does this group on this side of the room have the right to take money from this group on this side of the room? I thought that was all that Schlafly talked about. Uh, so I'm not quite, I understand you may have other arguments for Schlafly, uh, but, I, but it struck me that was the only thing. <clears throat> I think the point he was making about Rosie the Riveter was not that Rosie the Riveter wasn't important. Uh, I suspect he would have said, had the same school taught about the Women's Army Corps, Air Corps, had they taught about women's roles in ferrying aircraft, et cetera, he would have found it much more appealing. But he was trying to make a point about the way we approach World War II. World War II was probably as as elegantly fought and as heroic a war as we've ever had. And it involved an enormous amount of sacrifice. Uh, and that is not the model that is normally taught. I mean, the example again uh, is, is trying to discuss Hiroshima and Nagasaki without discussing Pearl Harbor or without discussing what the estimates were of casualties if in fact we had not used the atomic bomb. I mean, it's pretty easy to say, boy, that's really terrible to use an atomic bomb. It's pretty hard to say, okay, you're Harry Truman. You're being told five million Japanese and a million Americans will be killed. Now, you have two choices. Which do you do? As uh, Charlton Heston was one of the 18-year-old paratroopers in training to go into Japan. He said he was eternally grateful because he frankly didn't think he'd live. If you looked at Iwo Jima and you looked at Okinawa, you looked at the casualty rate and you projected and said, what was this going to be like? And I think what, what that particular author is talking about is that there's an, a consistent bias against American heroism, American decency in the modern academic elites. Down here on the floor. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel Feng. I'm a mid-career MPA student here at Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Uh, speak of American exceptionalism, Mr. Speaker. In 1998, under your speakership, the Congress passed a uh, the uh, Foreign Affairs Reform and the Restructuring Act, which among other things, abolished the U.S. Information Agency. Now, uh, this has uh, received uh, criticism uh, along the way. Uh, the typical example is four years ago, the Republican uh, presidential candidate, uh, John McCain, made it a, his uh, campaign pledge to re-establish information agency. Now, my question to you is, um, in hindsight, do you think uh, it was a mistake to abolish the agency in 1998? And uh, would you seek, if you, are, uh, if you are the president, seek to re-establish this agency, or something to that effect, to revitalize American public diplomacy? Uh, why and why not? Okay, <clears throat> it's a great question. I think it was a mistake. Uh, I think we greatly underestimated how much it would be, uh, in effect, uh, destroyed by the State Department bureaucracy. I strongly favor reestablishing a U.S. information agency, having it under an independent board, and reverting to the model we used so effectively in the Cold War. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My name is Christopher Lloyd. I'm a second year student at the Harvard Business School. In your movie, you talked about the importance of virtue to the idea of American exceptionalism. I was wondering if you could talk about some of the ethical principles that drive your decision making, and also given some of your public um, ethical lapses, how can America be sure that you'd be a virtuous president? Well, I think first of all, that as a general rule, what the Founding Fathers meant by virtue was in fact their behavior in public life, and their commitment to the country, and their dedication to the country. Uh, and I think that in that sense, as I said earlier, I've spent 53 years trying to understand how to help save this country. I've had a very long and consistent career in terms of advocating a whole set of values that involve smaller government, lower taxes, balanced budgets, uh, and, and strong American nationalism. Uh, and I think you can look at my record overall, and then you have to decide for yourself. But I think <clears throat> in terms of being both consistent and willing to absorb a pretty substantial beating from the elite media, I prob I'm probably uh, as willing to sacrifice for this country's future uh, as anybody you've seen in public life in your lifetime. And I do it because I think in the tradition of my stepfather, who, as I said earlier, was a career infantryman for 27 years, I think some citizens have to be engaged directly uh, in trying to stand up for the country. Speaker Gingrich. 
Thank you for your service and for your time. My name is Luke Scanlon. I'm a mid-career uh, MPA here at the Kennedy School. Um, and so I'm one of the conservative students here in the body. And uh, we have a great time finding gr a lot of conversation with all of our colleagues. Uh, as I recently told someone, we've learned how to get along despite our differences and understand better why that we disagree. One of the things that many of us are concerned about is corporate donations to campaigns and a fear that campaigns, particularly politics, can be bought and no longer really truly accessible to everybody. So as a president, what are you going to do about making sure that when we have donations, that that does not override the political process? And something else along those lines is, how much time are people actually spending the people that we elect, how much time are they spending understanding politics versus out raising money for the next campaign? It's a great, those are both great questions. They're, they're very important questions and, and they, I, I wanna deal with them separately because they're, they're so important. I think the entire post-Watergate micro-bureaucratization of politics has been a disaster. When you set a $2,500 cap on what people can give, what you actually do is guarantee that incumbents spend all their time raising money. And their goal is to create a mountain so high that no challenger can match it, because the challenger has to go out and try to raise $2,500 units, and they can't do it. Now, some of you say, well, there's too much money spent in politics. I would just say to you, this is a very expensive country. Look at the amount of money we spend for cat food. I mean, look at the amount of money we spent for deodorant. I mean, this is a very expensive country. <laughs> You're trying to deal with a government that is a $4 trillion government. You're going to have a lot of money spent in some form. I think we'd be vastly better off to have a very simple law that says anyone can give any amount of after-tax income as long as it is reported every night on the Internet, and you would overnight reduce the amount of time people spend raising money. And you'd have people be able to say, look, if you don't want to donate to me, that's fine. I'm going to go over here. I mean, my, my experience was I never had to change a position in order to raise money. I had to find the people who agreed with my position. And if I found people who agreed with my position, I could raise a fair amount of money. Uh, the second half of what you said, though, I think is really a disaster at, at two different levels. What, what's happened is we've grown a consulting industry so that instead of having the old-time big city machine bosses, you now have these consultants. And these consultants earn a living, and, and sometimes an extraordinarily good living, out of, sell, you know, out of buying advertising and getting a percent of what they buy. And so the consultants are very heavily in favor of advertising, and they're very heavily in favor of very simple-minded candidates whose primary job is to raise money. So the ideal consultant model is you go out and raise money in order to hire me. I will then write talking points for you to get through the news program, and I will then take the money you hired to write really vicious 30-second ads and push pull polls and other things, so you'll win the election, and then you'll arrive in Washington knowing nothing. But when you get to Washington, you could hire a chief of staff, who will then write talking points for you while you go to the, you know. This is, when you go back and you study people like Lincoln, or Jefferson, or Washington, or even up as late as FDR, and, and, and in a unique way, Ronald Reagan, who was totally an anomaly and outside the normal system. Uh, Lincoln personally spends three months researching his speech at Cooper Union. He personally writes it. He understands what his, you know, he knows what he's saying. I mean, people, you know, people talk about the, these debates recently. You know, the truth is, I, I prepare for debates seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. And then sometimes the debate shows up. But I don't go rushing around and say to my team, why don't you tell me the seven things I should memorize for this evening? Uh, I find, I mean, I just think that's appalling. Because the person you elect has to go and actually make real decisions. And so I think, I think this whole current model has got to be fundamentally rethought. Up there. First off, Speaker Gingrich, I'd just like to thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm a freshman at the college. And my question is, a recent study by researchers at Harvard Business School and Duke University found profound economic inequality in the United States. The wealthiest 20% 20, 20 of Americans hold 85% of the wealth, while the poorest 40% hold less than 1%. And the OECD recently found that social mobility across generations in the United States is among the lowest in the developed world. If 
a core American value is that all men and women are created equal. Are we upholding that value for children born into such profound inequality? And if not, how can we as a nation do better? That's a good. Uh, I think that's a very good question. I would say to you that uh, the report you just read represents three different parallel policies of government failure. The third, the third and most recent is the collapse in housing values. Since the middle class built a large part of its wealth around its homes, when you have an across the board collapse in housing value, you just devalue a large part of the savings of the middle class and you guarantee an increase in inequality because of the scale of loss they have because they, they disproportionately have their wealth captured in their homes. Uh, second, the collapse of manufacturing and having had a government policy which has been explicitly anti-manufacturing means that people who are at the margins who historically would have worked their way up, and Rick Santorum is actually totally right on this, uh, the people who would have worked themselves up through manufacturing jobs don't have, don't have jobs. And so you cut off the way in which they would have risen so that they might well have had a pretty good job working in a blue collar factory while their child got a pretty good job running the blue collar factory and their grandchild got a pretty good job owning the blue collar factory. Today, that first rung is gone. Third, and this is something that no liberal wants to deal with. The core policies of protecting unionization and bureaucratization against children in the poorest neighborhoods, crippling them by putting them in schools that fail, has done more to create income inequality in the United States than any other single policy. It is tragic what we do in the poorest neighborhoods in trapping children, in, first of all, in child laws, which are truly stupid. Okay, you say to somebody, you shouldn't go to work before you're what? 14, 16 years of age, fine. You're totally poor. You're in, a, you're in a school that is failing with a teacher that is failing. I tried for years to have a very simple model. Most of these schools ought to get rid of the unionized janitors, have one master janitor, and pay local students to take care of the school. The kids would actually do work. They would have cash. They'd have pride in the schools. They begin the process of rising. You go out and talk to, as I do regularly, you talk to people who are really successful in one generation. They all started their first job between 9 and 14 years of age. They all were either selling newspapers, going door to door. They were doing something. They were washing cars. They all learned how to make money at a very early age. What do we say to poor kids in poor neighborhoods? Don't do it. I mean, remember all the stuff about don't get a hamburger flipping job? The worst possible advice to give to poor children. Get any job that teaches you to show up on Monday. Get any job that teaches you to stay all day, even if you're having a fight with your girlfriend. I mean, the whole process of get, making work worthwhile is central. We have cut, and this is a huge, you, you put your finger on it. I take seriously that every American of every ethnic background in every neighborhood has the right to pursue happiness, and that it was endowed by their creator. That means you're going to see from me extraordinarily radical proposals to fundamentally change the culture of poverty in America and to give people a chance to rise very rapidly. One last example. Jack Kemp and I worked in the 80s on a concept where people in public housing could acquire sweat equity by taking care of the public housing. They could only over time own the public housing. We were deeply attacked by liberals in the Congress who said, do you realize in New York City, if you allowed poor people to acquire ownership of their condominiums, they could sell them for over a million dollars and they wouldn't be poor anymore. And we said, yes. I mean, do you realize what you just said? <laughs> and the people who most opposed it were the housing unions who did not want to see the housing authority replaced by poor people rising to middle class status. I just share that, those ideas. Probably only got time for two more questions. So this one and this one, I'll try to keep them brief. And I apologize to the others. Mr. Speaker, first, thank you so very much for your service. And also, thank you for your intellectual representation of conservatism. I greatly appreciate, appreciate it on a personal level and on a, a level much bigger than myself. I, just before getting my question, I want to remind everybody that that disagreement does not need to entail disrespect. And unfortunately, sitting in the audience, having to listen to, to snickers and sneers and all of that uh, upon your video, I, I find that quite unfortunate that that could occur here at such a wonderful university. And now to get to my question. What's your, I'm sorry, what's your name? My name is Justin Smith, and I'm an alum of the Extension School. So I, I, I actually really did work my way into Harvard, you could say. Uh, my question is this, Mr. Speaker. 
many characterize uh, a lot of the things that you have done uh, in your, as your tenure as speaker and as a politician, uh, such as having the video afterwards with, with Nancy Pelosi and working with many Democrats is gonna be or your Achilles heel in, in this uh, primary. But uh, don't you think you could characterize that as your one really true advantage that in this time where things are so polarized as we've seen with these 99 and one percenters that, and as you said, we are the 100%. I mean, isn't that not your, your biggest advantage? Well, I'm not sure it's my biggest advantage. <laughs> <laughs> but look, I, I do think it's an advantage, and, and I think, frankly, the Pelosi ad was a mistake. I've, I've said it was just a dumb ad. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm prepared to debate any conservative about the time I spent going around the country with Reverend Al Sharpton, mm -hmm. talking about the importance of charter schools going into black neighborhoods where he had real standing and where people listened to him. And I would argue that, that anyone who truly wants to govern America has to be prepared to go into every neighborhood of every background in the entire country. And I can promise you that if I'm invited by the NAACP, I will go and speak to their convention. And if I'm invited uh, by, by LULAC or La Raza or anybody else, I will go and speak to their convention. We have to become a country in which we're prepared to speak across boundaries. When we passed welfare reform, it was 101 Democrats voting yes and 101 Democrats voting no. It is possible to govern in a bipartisan manner. Remember, nothing I accomplished as speaker would have become law without Bill Clinton's signature. So you have to, nothing that Ronald Reagan wanted to have accomplished could get through the US House without one third of the Democrats because O'Neill was the speaker. And so we had to peel away a third of the Democrats on every key vote in order to pass things in Reagan's first term. So I've had a long period experience of, of doing things this way. I, I, I do want to put in two, two quick commercials. If you'd like to know more about what I'm doing, go to my first name, it's newt.org. Mm -hmm. And I do want to ask all of you to, cons I'm not going to ask any of you to be for me. Because if you're for me, you'll vote yes and go home and hope that I fix it. I will ask you all to consider being with me for the next eight years, because this is going to be a tremendous struggle, and I will need you with me every day for eight years to get this accomplished. And now you get the last question. Yeah. Name is, my name is Razvan Oreshano. I'm with a Masters in Public Policy. I would ask you to comment whether or not you would extend uh, the concept that you presented before us, the American exceptionalism, to the situation where 180 countries in the world pay, for example, their dues to the United Nations, and the United States does not. I'd also ask you to say whether, in your opinion, it is American exceptionalism that the Treaty Against Landmines, for example, and the Kyoto Protocol are two things that most of the countries in the world have signed up to and the United States has not. So with the greatest respect, I'm going to ask you yes or no. If you become president of the United States, will the US fall back on its due to the United Nations? Will you sign the Landmine Treaty and will you sign the Kyoto Protocol? Thank you. No. <laughs> I mean, if, you, if all you want is a yes or no, the answer is no. The Kyoto Protocol is, is incredibly written to the advantage of the Europeans and explicitly against our advantage. It couldn't get a single vote in the United States Senate, not even, not a single liberal Democrat voted for it because it was so badly written, okay? The landmine convention is a terrific idea as long as you're not sending troops anywhere. It's a terrible idea if in fact you're sending troops anywhere. So there are a lot of good reasons why the United States is very cautious about these things. Uh, third, I'm, I'm happy to consider paying dues to the United Nations. Remember, the, the current failure at UNESCO for us to pay our dues is a direct function of the fact that they have recognized the Palestinian Authority in absolute violation of the Oslo Accords and in a way which is a fundamental violation of the United States' position on, on uh, uh, the problems of the Middle East. But I will also tell you, I was co-chair of the United Nations Reform uh, Commission with uh, Senator George Mitchell. And the United Nations is one of those perfect examples of a place that has an image that has no relationship to its reality. Uh, and so I'm, I'm happy to represent American exceptionalism. And I suspect as president, I would nominate somebody to be uh, the, US, the UN ambassador who would be very aggressive in demanding reform at the UN and very aggressive in fighting against ideas that are antithetical to the values and the interests of the United States. I'm, I have no interest in, in any way, abrogating America's interest on behalf of some vague concept of internationalism, 
uh, that, that in fact I think has no context in, in, in the real world. I want to thank you, thank Mrs. N Mrs. Gingrich uh, for a very educational and entertaining evening. Thank the audience for being so good. And please join me in thanking you. Thank you. That was great. Thank that you. worked out well. Um, if you know that uh, Bobby Ingalls is a standing letter.